Hi everyone, welcome to our IEEE Big Data Analytics tutorial series. This is Chiu Shi from Arizona State University. Today we are honored to have Professor Zhu from University of Texas at Austin to be our monthly speaker. She's going to talk about the title of Spatial Temporal Learning for Enhanced Situational Awareness of the Power Grid. So we will see how he, how she explains the, how she achieved the situation awareness in the power system through machine learning. And uh, this tutorial is around 19 minutes long. In the end, I will organize the Q&A. During the talk, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me, uh, uh, send them to me through the chat box. Now, uh, now I'm going to give a little uh, brief uh, introduction of Professor Zhu. Professor Zhu is uh, currently uh, assistant professor in the ECE department at UT Austin. She, she received the bachelor degree from Tsinghua University in, in 2026 uh, and the master PhD degree from the University of Minnesota all in electrical engineering. She was a postdoc at the, uni at the University of Illinois. Her research focus is on developing innovative algorithm solutions for problems related to learning and optimization for future electric systems. Her current interests include physics aware and risk aware machine learning for power systems and the the design of uh, energy management systems that accounts for cyber physical coupling. She's the recipient of the NSF Career Award and the Civil Energy Institute Z Grant Award. She's uh, also faculty advisor for three best paper awarded at the NAPS. She's uh, currently a member of the IEEE PES Long Range Planning committee. So, okay, without further ado, I will give the speaker to Professor Zhu now. So, Professor Zhu, you can start now. Great. Uh, thank you, Zhu Shi, for the nice introduction um, and also the invitation to speak here. Um, it's my great pleasure to speak at this uh, distinguished seminar series. And I, I knew that yeah, this series started uh, a couple of years ago and now it's a, uh, I'm glad that we are still continue doing that, which also has more uh, impact now with the pandemic uh, going on. So yeah, so I'm very happy to uh, speak here today. So um, I'm going to talk about more of the ongoing and uh, finished work on spatial temporal learning for power system uh, situation awareness enhancement. So I'd like to thank my uh, current and also former students and collaborators who contributed uh, to this work and also funding uh, support from National Science Foundation. So, so the problem that we are looking at in Power Grid is that we have witnessed a significant investment in infrastructure, especially with sensing infrastructure. So now we have more different type of data in both the uh, transmission grid and distribution grid. So on both sides, we have more of the synchronized phaser measurement units and they can take on high resolution and high race data at different locations of the grid, um, which we are more familiar with in the transmission side. In the distribution side, in addition to like also the synchronized data, we also witness like smart meter data. They don't have the good uh, time resolution as we all know due to the standard setup. So, but then they are uh, installed everywhere, almost in every load buses or every uh, load uh, residential homes that in most of the utilities in North America, at least. So the question that we would like to ask is that, 
can we learn from this increasing volume of data under different spatial or temporal resolutions? And if so, what are the interesting problems that we can solve respectively for transmission grade and also for distribution grade? So on the transmission side in the wet area grid, the problem that we are looking at is the grid dynamics, as we know that with the synchronized data and also high rates of uh, PMU data, we have the opportunity to look into the dynamic response of the system. So this is one event that, um, um, I don't know if, sorry, I'm trying to get on the, uh, the uh, animation here. So basically this is a video uh, generated by the FNET or grid I uh, data showing the frequency of response of different grid. Um, apologies, let me try to do it over here now. Can you all still see the, uh, the slides? Yes, I can see the slide. Yeah, and, uh, yeah so I think I can only play it on this monitor. So yeah, so uh, this is the animation generated by the FNAT devices, uh, which is the frequency distribution level like uh, connected, but it can uh, monitor the wide area frequency uh, deviation. And it's shown for blackout event back in 2008 for uh, uh, source uh, disturbance happened uh, started in Florida. So you can see that from the right control view, the frequency oscillates uh, around 60 hertz and started from the Florida, the source of disturbance and propagates for to the whole North America, uh, or actually the Eastern interconnection. Um, so uh, this is uh, where we are known as the electromechanic oscillation events uh, happening for all the interconnected system. So these kind of events, they happen very rarely. Although we have the PMU or install for it, we don't know how, we don't have a lot of these events to do post analysis. What uh, post event analysis? What we have more is actually uh, ambient data, meaning that during a typical operational day and then there's no disturbance where you have uh, small perturbations around the grid. So for this, type of dynamic, uh, uh, grid dynamics that is of high interest for the power system. The question we are trying to uh, ask is that, can we predict how the system would uh, react under this dynamic disturbance input using uh, ambient single phase data, which we collected every day, um, which do not show this high level of disturbance. Okay, so why is this a difficult problem? Let me show you just like a sample ambient data. So this is a frequency data during a normal operation conditions. It has very small, slow, slow variations, which is what we call the trend. So this is showing in, um, in the uh, slow uh, variation trend here. So this is the quasi static behavior of the grid, which does not capture the uh, grid dynamics. And uh, to understand the grid dynamics, we have to first filter out this trend. And this is typically called the detrending process in the system. And you can see from here, this is after this detrending of this underlying quasi static behavior, this uh, dynamic signature in the ambient data is mostly like white noise. So there is not much perturbation going on here. And that's why we uh, can only see this white noise behavior. So uh, it is very difficult to see how the system react in this uh, after this detrending process. And the similar problem also happens in other type of dynamic oscillation systems. And the example we uh, have here is also in the earthquake waves or in seismology. We know uh, one uh, interest question that seismologists facing is very similar to power system where you have that in a normal a nominal day, the earth 
uh, media has small perturbations, which looks like a noise waveforms, uh, which is similar to like the white noise uh, after the trending process of the, in the ambient uh, frequency data. And the problem faced by seismologists is that how can we know what, uh, what uh, actual large disturbance happened, how will the uh, system reacts or how will this large disturbance propagate from one location to another location. So that's exactly the same problem faced in power system. And they identify approach uh, using coarse colorating this no a noisy waveform to recover this disturbance response. So we will also explore this same idea for the power grid as well. So just a little bit uh, literature review on the power grid. Uh, in, um, uh, there is a lot of work on trying to look at the coloration of ambient frequency or angle or voltage data. However, it is mainly used to do mode estimation, basically trying to understand what is the oscillation frequency or what's the damping ratio from uh, this cross coloration of ambient data, but not used for recovering the dynamic response behavior. Um, uh, recently, there is a line of work trying to use that to estimate Jacobian, the state tra space based transition matrix, but then they require basically observability or uh, having uh, uh, data uh, meter installed at every location. Um, in 2012, there was another work which explore this cross correlation idea. However, they have very strong assumptions on the homogeneity of these waves, these oscillation propagation waves, say meaning that it has the wave has to propagate in the same speed to uh, every location uh, in a two dimensional plane, which we all know based on that uh, earlier animation or the video, and usually this oscillation does not propagate in a uniform speed. So what we are trying to look at here is to explore the analytical guarantees that this cross coloration approach would work for the actual power system uh, dynamic response, basically the small signal inertial response. However, we want to understand whether it would work under a typical great operating assumptions, not necessarily this uniform uh, homogeneous uh, propagation speed assumption. So this is what we are trying to do for this work. Okay, so I'm going to start a little bit on the type of model that we're going to consider, um, trying to introduce it at high level, and then uh, also showing the kind of conditions that why cross coloration will work. So the type of dynamic model that we're considering is the second order swing equations that is usually used for analyzing uh, small signal analysis uh, perturbations for power system dynamics. So it's based on the Newton's second law for uh, uh, um, for the angular uh, uh, oscill oscillation, basically at every generator is angular acceleration denoted by the second order derivative of the generator rotor angle um, is re uh, related to the local power imbalance. So the on the right hand side, uh, it is captures all the power uh, imbalance related to say the local input from mechanic power deviations and also the land flow deviations um, um, PIJ here. Um, so the second term here on the left hand side is we know the damping effects which is really related to the speed or namely the uh, derivative of the angle. Um, so we all know that the speed is also related to the frequency that is directly measured in the grid. Um, so again, just to point out that this is the small signal perturbation model. So uh, all the quantity here are actually the deviation from their nominal value uh, as uh, opposed to the actual value. 
So under this uh, kind of model, we can uh, concatenate all the system quantities together to form the vector system model. In addition, we also can uh, linearize this line flow or the power flow at the operating point such that it becomes a linear transformation of the angle delta here. So this becomes the total linear system um, after this uh, power flow linearization approach. And then just to uh, connect to the scalar model, this M and D uh, diagonal matrix is consisting of the momentum, angular momentum, and also damping coefficients. And the K here is the linearization of power flow, which is basically the power flow Jacobian matrix. And U again is the local input. So the delta is the state variables, the, um, um, the angle, uh, the rotor angle everywhere, and also we know its derivative is the speed, uh, generation speed everywhere related to the uh, frequency. So this is the second order dynamic model. We also have the system operating under the ambient condition. So what we meant by ambient condition, basically we assume that the input U here is a small perturbation coming from the load uh, variations or some small variations of renewable resources. So the input is a zero mean and also a white noise type of input. Um, so its expectation is zero and also is uncolorated across some time. And it has this when um, the tau is equal to zero, it is, helps us to define the second order uh, uh, covariance of this noise, which is given by the sigma here. So under this kind of input, we know the system is driven by stationary noise. Therefore, our system states, which is basically the frequency or the speed or angle are also stationary and also their zero mean as well. So this is, basically why we are observing that the actual frequency after detrending is like a white noise as well. Okay, so this is our ambient data model. So again, what we are trying to do here? Um, so we are trying to uh, come up with this dynamic response, assuming there is an impulse uh, input disturbance at the source location, any location K, we want to know how the system would respond in terms of frequency or angle in any other location L. So we want to know this propagation model from location K to location L. So what we can we will prove analytically is that this response, this disturbance response T from location K to location L can be uh, recovered using the actual data, ambient data collected at these two locations, K and L, through the cross-coloration operation. So cross-coloration is similar to um, coloration or auto-coloration that uh, we defined for a single data stream. It is trying to understand the similarity of two different data streams under different time lag uh, given by this tau here. So because of the uh, ambient condition, the date, uh, the input, and also the system stays uh, stationary, we know that this cost coloration can be given by the expectation of this, imp, uh, this uh, average quantity, omega kt and omega uh, k, uh, lt minus tau here. So uh, it suffices for us to show it for this expectation of this um, difference of these two states under uh, a fixed uh, time uh, interval tau. So this is uh, what we're going to show later on. So a lot of these details about our work is given in this journal uh, publication that we have in 2008. And I'm just gonna go to show a sketch of why this idea works uh, uh, here. Before that, um, let's talk a little bit about the intuition why this work. So the intuition here is that the cross-coloration 
as I just mentioned, is defined for any two uh, input data streams. So for example, here you see that these two input are some uh, sinusoidal waveforms and they look like that they have some kind of constant time uh, difference between this blue and uh, the red uh, waveforms here. So what cross coloration does is that I fix one waveform and I move, say I fix the blue waveform here, the blue sinusoidal here, and I move the red sinusoidal for different time lag. And I'm trying to evaluate the similarity of these two waveforms under these various time lags. Um, so plot it out in this cross coloration of these two uh, waveforms. So as shown here, when the, the two waveforms are under this uh, uh, time lag, which is corresp uh, corresponding corresponds to this time difference here, then I have a peak. So uh, these two waveforms are most similar under this time lag here. Okay, and then when the uh, when I move it the right waveforms further and further, this similarity reduces. And then that's why we have zero around this uh, time lag here. So basically cross correlation can help us to evaluate the similarity of two waveforms under different time lags. And this um, propagation of oscillations exactly follows this similarity metro. So that's why we can use this cross correlation to recover their temporal similarity between this uh, ambient data um, in a way. So um, we have also shown it for different quantities, not just the frequency data. So supposedly we can also try to recover the response to an uh, angle uh, data, meaning that if I have an input at location K again, how would angle at location L respond? And we show that it is also equivalent to the cross coloration of the, an, uh, the, um, the angle ambient data at these two locations. The difference here is that we have to also take a derivative. Um, so the value of this result compared to the uh, frequency result is that we know that usually PMU data ha has better accuracy in the angle observation uh, than the frequency observation because the frequency observation is filtered from the angle data through some DSP uh, operation. So this more recent result um, that we have here, which is cross coloration of amb uh, ambient angle data uh, is expected to have higher accuracy. So similarly, um, well, we know that under uh, the linearized power flow model, the line flow is a linear transformation of the angle data. So we can also try to recover the dynamic response of the angle uh, sorry, of the line flow data at every any location. And the intuition behind that is also that we can use the ambient uh, angled data based on this linear transformation from angle data to the line flow data. We can similarly establish that the angle data, um, the line flow data can be recovered from the uh, and uh, the cross coloration of the ambient uh, uh, angle data and also the ambient land flow data. So this is, these two are, are um, more recent results that we have established uh, uh, as well. So uh, yeah, so just to show a little bit the intuition behind our analytical results, why this cross coloration uh, would work, uh, in a, we can consider a simple case, which is that the system does not have any damping. So the damping coefficient D here is zero. We only have the inertial and also um, the power flow Jacobian matrix. So to uh, simplify the analysis, we use the fact that the uh, M is a diagonal matrix and therefore it's positive definite. It has diagonal positive values and the power flow Jacobian is symmetric. That 
uh, condition assumption two here allows us to nicely decouple the second order undamped oscillation into individual oscillation modes denoted by Z through this transformation, linear transformation uh, under this generalized eigenvalue uh, C matrix here, uh, which is the generalized eigenvectors for M and K matrix. So this simple uh, uh, condition allows us to do this decoupling, the mode decoupling very easily. So each mode is purely sinusoidal because there is no oscillation. And therefore, we can analytically write out this frequency response as a linear combination of each individual mode, which are purely co uh, cosine responses of sinusoidal function. So this is uh, the well-known process that we can do based on the actual model. So why would cross-coloration help us to recover these sinusoidal modes? So one interesting uh, condition that we further assume is that if I have all the modes homogeneously excited, meaning that the modes have identical uh, uh, excitation level and also the modes are uncolorated, then I will be able to show that if I cross-colorate these two ambient response, then the ambient uh, cross-coloration of sinusoidal functions can recover these sinusoidal modes perfectly under this homogeneous uh, excitation condition. So this is uh, one this is basically the idea why I'm able to recover this uh, uh, unknown um, combi linear combinations of cosine uh, modes everywhere in the system using cross coloration. And it's exactly the fact that I can do it for every mode uh, individually in the analysis step. And I don't need to worry about the mode coupling between mode I and mode J under this homogeneity condition. So this is very nice. I'm able um, using to use this undamped uh, analysis condition to show it very easily. Of course, uh, we know that all the system has the damping. Um, so one thing that uh, I'm uh, need to also show is that, uh, or I'm able to generalize to is that when there is damping in the system, as long as this damping is uniform, meaning that this damping coefficient for each mode is similar, uh, is the same, then I can uh, show that this uh, damped response is still sinusoidal, but it's now damped sinusoidal response, but I still have this homogeneity condition for this oscillation modes. So the modes are still equally excited and they're also uncolorated across modes. And that, that help, has helped us to ensure that the equivalence between cross coloration and the uh, uh, actual system response is still equivalent. So this is the more generalized condition that we are uh, able to show in the paper, and I encourage you to take a look at it. But basically, uh, what we were able to show is that um, if the system is uniformly damped, then the equivalence between cross coloration and uh, the uh, impulse response can be analytically established. So this is the uh, results uh, for the analytical side. Uh, just to uh, uh, recap on this, how this algorithm work, say that if I have um, a source uh, location that I'm interested to investigate, and I want to know uh, how uh, a disturbance from this source location is gonna propagate to any target location. So this can be any target location, and I can um, know any type of uh, response at the target location, either frequency or angle or the land flow power response. So I can pick any of these data types to investigate and similarly for the source location. So after detraining the ambient data, I got the corresponding um, noise like output for these two locations. And I do the simple cross coloration operation here and I can get output. And this 
a very nice feature of this method or in general cross correlation is that it's very computationally efficient because it's basically uh, like a, um, a, a data streaming uh, uh, um, uh, operation here. And depending on the data type that I'm interested in investigate here, I may need to do a derivative step, which is again also very simple to ca calculate. So basically that's how we uh, uh, implement this algorithm. So just to show some uh, numeric results, we have some uh, um, actual system testing that we know how to uh, uh, generate actual system response. And then we can compile the data uh, from the ambient response synthetically generated either by using the linearized model or through time domain situ uh, simulation. So this is the uh, three generator numbers uh, case where I have three input and also three uh, generator uh, uh, frequency or speed and angle output. So just to uh, note that this system is not lossless uh, as I mentioned that we need one condition that K, the powerful Jacobian matrix is perfectly symmetric, but we know that this is not the case when we have transmission losses, but it doesn't affect our result uh, much, very, uh, very much as you will see later on. So here uh, we first test the system under second order dynamics and uh, which basically is the swing equation here. Um, so I have the system losses here and what I plotting here is column is for a uh, impulse or disturbance from one location and each row corresponding to the response of frequency at any uh, one of the three generators. So as we know that if the uh, disturbance is local, so from uh, the local input U1 to the generator frequency output at omega one, then we know that the frequency will uh, deviate in respond instantaneously. However, if you go to another um, generator two or three, it will take some time for this to respond, to, for the uh, disturbance to react. So uh, either way, we uh, have seen that this is perfect match between the uh, data-driven uh, approach, the cross-correlation approach using either synthetic data generated from the linearized model or time domain simulation. Um, so we, uh, uh, because the linearized model is faster to compute, uh, we're not gonna have time domain simulation for the rest of the validation later on. So uh, this is the frequency response. Uh, we also uh, show that uh, in terms of the angle response at every uh, generator rotor angle, it also has very nice response here. Um, um, it is, has the perfect recovery response at uh, any uh, generator rotor angle response. And uh, similarly, the line flow response is very accurate as well. Uh, we can see that uh, the land flow, the land power flow, when there is a disturbance, would uh, uh, oscillate around its nominal value uh, in a, in this fixed pattern, and we're able to recover that using the course correlation approach as well. So um, the second gener uh, the second order model. Um, is very uh, useful for an analysis, but we know that it is not uh, the case uh, in general. Uh, there are also some control actions in the generator which results in higher order dynamics. So we also test uh, this method under this high order dynamics. So what we notice is that, yes, usually under high order dynamics, you see more of the damping uh, effects of this uh, uh, frequency response. Um, as, however, the difficulty for our method here is that we, uh, under the high order dynamics, there will be some coloration of the modes. As a result, there is some mismatch in say that the oscillation amplitude here. Um, 
And we have seen of uh, these effects due to these high order dynamics. But uh, still, the recovered uh, response, the estimated from uh, course coloration, the blue curve here, can capture the peak location very well, which suggests that it's able to um, identify the propagation time very well. So similar uh, observation for the angle response as well. Um, so there is some mismatch error in the amplitude, uh, but then the general shape of the oscillation is still captured very well. Um, uh, so in terms of uh, the land flow, we realize that because land flow is related to angle difference, actually it seems to be more accurate than the recovery of angle. And this is because that the arrow resulted from the angle uh, can be canceled out when we calculate uh, the land flow response. And this is the nice part of uh, trying to recover the angle response uh, as a result. So we have also tested on the actual system. We were fortunate to uh, obtain like 15 minutes of F9 device data. And then, yeah, this is the sample F9 device data that I showed you earlier. And we did a detraining process. And then you can see definitely the uh, ambient data uh, is very much like a white noise. So we implement the course coloration ideas on multiple uh, locations of F9 uh, data and compare it to this actual response in terms of the recovery time that I have, um, we have recorded from the 2008 uh, uh, um, uh, uh, blackout event. So what I'm showing here is this recorded blackout based on this video that um, the video that uh, you have seen earlier um, from this actual event started from Florida to um, most of the Eastern interconnection. So these red values are the actual recorded time extracted from that video. And then we have also formed this uh, uh, way from the, all the, uh, the red curves here um, captures uh, the same uh, locations with the same propagation time in terms of 1.0 second, 1.5 second, and then 2.0 second. So you can definitely see that this wave propagation is not uniform, meaning that it's not just based on the, um, this term, uh, the uh, distance between the target location and the source location. So you, here you see that there are some kind of uh, uh, flip here, like uh, this is 2.5 second, while this one is 2.0 uh, is, uh, 2 second. But then this inconsistency is due to the fact that we don't have too much observation here. So um, we don't have too many meters here. So there is some kind of uh, ambiguity in this data set, um, in this uh, 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 recorded uh, uh, propagation time. But what I would like to point out is that we use the real data, um, the 15 minute data and do the cross correlation and we're able to estimate the propagation time from that. And it is pretty accurate uh, only with around uh, most of the time is 0.1 second of mismatch error. And this is because the FNI data is 10 samples per second. So it has a 0.1 second uh, uh, sampling uh, or uh, time resolution uh, here. So that's why um, we have observed this uh, uh, mismatch error, which is in the order 0.1 second, shows to be consistent with what we have uh, 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 um, um, extracted from the actual event propagation time. So with that, I uh, have a uh, concrete talk about this wide area dynamic model. So we would uh, really, uh, we are really excited about this cross correlation idea, which is a totally model free approach that enables us to recover the dynamic response from any disturbance input to uh, any um, system output at any location in uh, interconnected system. 
And uh, we particularly like it because although it's model free, it's also it's built upon it's built upon this second order dynamic model, and we understand why it would work for a real system. And we know that when it has some little bit issue, and uh, what why it is not working that well. So it has interesting applications. Uh, we can use it to recover missing data points because we know how the system would actually respond. So that allows us to recover missing data streams. And it is very computationally efficient compared to numeric uh, solution to trying to understand the system dynamic behavior. And also we, uh, we can evaluate uh, how say that if I implement a control action and I can immediately uh, evaluate the effectiveness of this control action by looking at how the system would respond uh, uh, under this cross coloration technique. So these are the um, uh, applications that we envision for um, this proposed uh, cross coloration idea. So this is uh, actually a good uh, stopping time for the first part. Um, I can take some questions uh, if, uh, um, um, Chushu, you think it's a, um, a good time? Yes, and so far, yeah, I have one, uh, yeah, one audience is going to ask, I, I, I will unmute him, and there is a one question. Hi, Raj, you can ask. Hey, thank you. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, so. I have a question with regards to the setup. So why can't we just uh, use more estimation algorithms which includes the subspace estimation technique and then first obtain the system dynamics and then use those dynamics to understand the impact of the inputs, right? right. And that's, I, I can do that one as well. Uh, so why to use the you know, cross correlation technique? Yes, very great question. Um, so, uh, uh, this uh, estimation approach that you mentioned um, definitely will work if we have very good uh, op meter coverage. Basically, if I have the meter, so this is one of the early work that I mentioned uh, that you can uh, put it into this ambient data and then try to establish or do system identification for it. Um, and then use this identified system model to uh, uh, to analyze the system response. So this two-step approach would work, as I mentioned, if I have very good uh, meter coverage. If not, it may suffer from like a lack of observability issue. So what we are showing here is that regardless of how many meters I have, as long as I have these two location data that I want to investigate, I will be able to recover that. So it doesn't require the number of meters that I have for the system. Uh, okay, I can, yeah. correct me if I am wrong, but I got, I got your point. But so in your setup also where you considered the uh, state space model that also requires uh, an observability to you know capture the dynamics, right? Without the observability, you were um, correlation metric. Right. Um, it also drops some information, correct? Right, so the analysis would require that I have this model, but then after, so I only use this analysis to show the equivalence, but it, to implement this method, uh, like showing in this plot, I don't require any of that model information or metering coverage information. Yes, maybe I'll follow up this question. I mean, uh, uh... Okay, uh, I just do not want to waste the time. Okay, thank you for your answer. Oh, okay, thank you yeah. for the question. Yeah, 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 definitely we can, uh, yeah, come back to that later. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, if there's no further questions, so I will uh, go to the second part. Um, so on second part is on the local area or distribution grids where we see there's more and more like distributed energy resources. How, so they are not directly observed by, uh, observed by uh, grid operators. So one example, if we can think of is like say, um, 
uh, individual customers uh, 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 like uh, charge their own EVs. All these EVs are managed by aggregators. So um, from the uh, grid operators, it only has say the very low resolution smart meter data every 15 minutes. And it may not be able to know that where exactly say this EV event happens. And uh, or even if it happens because of this average, it loses like say the kind of power uh, uh, demand change uh, due to this 15 minute average. So the other example is the behind meter solar uh, generation issue, which we know that uh, there are a lot of uh, solars uh, underneath like a distribution feeder. However, it is uh, unclear how can we separate uh, the solar from the demand or the low demand in the distribution uh, 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 data. So, so the second part of this talk is about how we can increase this visibility at grid edge, um, specifically for these distributed energy resources, uh, uh, EV, uh, EVs or PVs. So, uh, so this is the overview of the system setup. As I mentioned, like um, the in distribution side, almost every load node has their individual measurements like smart meter. However, these meters uh, low has low time resolution. They have great coverage there almost everywhere, but then they are not able to uh, capture the high, uh, uh, the fast change events uh, in um, uh, due to say appliance or like EV charging. Uh, or they don't have the right solar signature in it. Um, so the idea is that if say that we also have the grid level measurements that could be from distribution PMUs, uh, which you have like say aggregated power demand in selected location. So these PMUs, we all know they have high temporal resolution, but they don't have the spatial uh, diversity. So they only have for well, like one location or a couple of locations. Um, so it can be uh, PMUs, it can also be other type of measurements like you either like a smart protection devices, which basically provides these fast uh, measurements in uh, selected locations uh, on the grid. So the question here is that can we jointly use these two sources of data to improve the spatial temporal resolution uh, in order for monitoring these DRs? So um, a, a quick uh, setup on the uh, data model. Let's consider that uh, we have this PQ, uh, which is a sp uh, space and time uh, the, uh, matrix for the real and the re for active and the reactive power demand. So the rows corresponding to the load nodes uh, or houses, and the columns are like the time instance, or like for our setup is the high resolution time, like every minute. So as we say that a smart meter data is a linear transformation or is a temporal uh, compression or down sampling. So we can use this average operator uh, denoted by this A matrix to compress uh, this uh, uh, underlying uh, 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 load matrix PQ here. And even if we have asynchronous data, it is also possible uh, to do uh, to uh, represent it through some linear transformation. Um, but then it may be more complicated if we have asynchronous data. So uh, at the other side, uh, like the uh, DPMU, the aggregated data is a spatial uh, compression. So I'm actually multiplying a, a linear transformation from the uh, row from the left, uh, left side of the matrix X here, which is uh, consisting of uh, both B and Q here. So in general, I have to use say like a power flow model and to have this uh, linear transformation model, I have to linearize it, the nonlinear power flow model, which I will describe very soon in the next slide. But then just think about special case. If I have a lossless system, then this aggregated data is basically the summation of all the, uh, in, uh, of all the houses power demand. So it's just multiplied by this all one vector from the left. 
So in general, I use I need to use powerful linearization. Um, I don't intend to uh, spend too much time on this linearization process. There is a huge interest on um, looking at power, a distribution system, multi-phase uh, nonlinear power flow model, um, because we know that it's basically a quadratic model when we look at from uh, the trans the mapping from the voltage phaser to the uh, power demand, say the S matrix, uh, S vector here. So the a specific method we are considering is called the fixed point method. Um, like um, these two papers are good references for that. Uh, it's different from the uh, traditional like first order Taylor expansion, which is only uh, looking at the derivative at uh, a specific operating point. This fix, uh, fixed point method is using two uh, points on this power flow equation nonlinear curve. One is the zero loading condition. Another one is this uh, a fixed power flow solution here. So it captures more of the global uh, curvature of this nonlinear power flow equation. Um, so we use this model and, oh, sorry, this uh, fixed point method. And then we use say the smart meter data to provide us a good accuracy. So the smart meter data serve as the other uh, linearization point here for us to uh, use this fixed point method. Um, I, uh, so we are able to write out this aggregated power demand as a linear function of the unknown PQ matrix. I would like to also point out that although we only consider the power measurements, you can uh, similarly say that if I have voltage or current phaser measurements, it can uh, be also written out as a linear transformation of this PQ matrix everywhere. Okay, so now if we have this model, then uh, it is very related to distribution state estimation. Or oh, as we know that uh, the majority of this work uh, has been mostly on the static uh, DSE formulation. So low observability is a, a huge issue in static DSE. And traditionally it is uh, enhanced by say pseudo measurements or like a load forecast. Um, so recently there's some interesting work on static DSE by looking at say like coupling two time instances. Um, um, so um, they're using some kind of assumptions like this, sec this work here saying that the loads don't change very frequently, which is indeed the case. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that uh, very soon. And uh, this, there's an, also another work which is related on static DSE using matrix completion. And it is trying to uh, uh, have um, solve also the low observability issue where you don't have many measurement locations and trying uh, to use the matrix completion to recover the data at every well in the distribution feeder. So these are all static approaches. Um, recently, uh, because of uh, uh, the introduction of PMU data, we can also do distributed uh, state estimation as we know, and there are some more recent work on that. Uh, however, we know in like uh, uh, traditional common filter type of uh, the dynamic uh, estimation approach, it needs to compute the inverse of the Hessian matrix. So we have a recent work uh, in this paper here, looking into a uh, uh, efficient uh, 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 called uh, prediction uh, correction PC method here, uh, which instead of using an uh, inverse of Hessian, we do a gradient descent, which is a linear uh, 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 transform, very uh, much more efficient compared to the common filter. So one observation, um, there are actually two observations that we have. So uh, for, uh, first of all, um, in distribution system, we observe that uh, the voltage uh, estimation is in general much more accurate than power um, estimation. So this is because that uh, the voltage sensitivity to power demand is relatively low. Um, so because um, of good control schemes, the voltage is usually close to one. So the voltage estimation error, as you see, the level is around 10 to the minus three is very uh, accurate. Well, it is much harder to estimate the power demand everywhere in the feeder. So 
uh, that uh, point out that the need that we actually need to cast the power demand as a state as what we were doing now. Secondly, uh, the observation is that, um, so this recursive or dynamic estimation approach works well if we have slow variation of the loads, but this is not the case in the actual distribution system. Um, so the load, we uh, took a closer look at the distribution loads. It actually has much, uh, 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 it has different characteristics compared uh, to like typical what we assume to a load that is slow varying as in transmission system. So what I'm gonna, uh, uh, look at next is how to utilize this specific load characteristics in distribution system to improve the design of the load recovery problem that I uh, introduced earlier. Okay, so the first uh, characteristics that we observe is that they're actually the loads have more of the sparse changes. And um, why it's the case is uh, actually, because we see that in if you look at the residential loads, it's mostly like appliance activities. So uh, they have uh, this on and off activities leads to some rectangular waveform, like showing here in the left, uh, this uh, uh, bolded area, this uh, seeker lines, uh, all these appliance activities uh, that you can see. Um, so. Um, this is one uh, very interesting uh, future of the uh, residential loads. And uh, we know that when you have the load on and off, the both uh, active and the reactive power would actually simultaneously change because um, this power factor of uh, the issue appliance. So um, most of the DERs uh, for like the example of the EVs that we introduced earlier also follow this type of sparse change characteristics. So um, they can be easily, uh, they can be, um, uh, these uh, kind of characteristics will be explored uh, later on. Um, just want to point out that um, uh, although I haven't shown it here, um, some kind of appliance like uh, what we all have uh, used in um, residential homes, the heat ventilation, air conditioner, HVAC, has more of a periodic uh, activity pattern. And this will actually be a complicating factor, um, although it is a uh, uh, sparse uh, change activities, but this periodicity will also interfere with the second characteristic Characteristics that we're pointing out here. So the second load characteristics, which is mainly due to the solar PV, is that um, uh, compared to the sparse changes, which they're independent from um, different residential homes, um, if the uh, houses uh, installed with rooftop uh, solar, they would have this uh, spatially colorated temporal pattern. So uh, indicated by the secret line here. Um, so this is because when these homes are uh, co-located, um, then local factors such as solar irradius or weather conditions would affect uh, these would be the main determining uh, uh, factors for this uh, solar output. So this colorated uh, uh, um, uh, uh, temporal pattern will manifest in itself in the low rank component in the load. So for our work, because we actually only have uh, real pow active power data, we only assume that the P matrix has this low rank um, factor. And this is also because uh, majority of inverters nowadays still operated under unit power factor setting. But uh, indeed, if we allow for reactive power support, we can also generate this low rank pattern or this colorated pattern to the reactive power matrix Q as well. Uh, but then for this uh, work, we only consider it for the P matrix. So here comes the complication with the HVAC part. If um, there's a HVAC has the periodicity, or if all the homes have the HVAC uh, activities, then this is also kind of spatially colorated as well. And um, 
so the HWAC uh, activity or periodicity would also participate in this temporal pattern, as we will see later on. Okay, so uh, just to uh, get uh, everything together, um, basically we are utilizing these two characteristics in uh, um, exploring the PQ model. So we have the same issue that we have low observability. We're trying to recover this big BQ matrix for a much less number of data. So we have to ex uh, utilize these two characteristics to improve its recovery. So uh, again, the characteristics is that since we have these sparse changes, so I'm using this U matrix to form the consecutive differences between uh, every slot and this next slot. So basically finding the difference between time T and T plus one under this U matrix. So after this uh, transformation, the PQ matrix have two components. One is this low rank one K due to the colorated, spatially colorated PV output. And the other one is the changes, the sparse changes, DP and DQ here. So one thing uh, that I mentioned earlier is because um, the um, appliance would uh, introduce simultaneous change in both real and the reactive power. Therefore, this PQ, uh, uh, DP and DQ are jointly sparse, meaning that when um, they are non-zero, both of them are non-zero, or uh, both of them are zero. So there's at the meaning of the joint sparsity here. So using these two characteristics, I'm able to uh, set up this recovery problem. Uh, basically, I use the nuclear norm, which is very well known for uh, multi-weight low rank uh, component K here. And also I use this L2 norm. So notice it's not a L2 norm square, but then the L2 norm itself on this uh, DPDQ vector and therefore I can have um, the group sparsity of this vector. So I use these two regula uh, regularization terms associated with uh, the two characteristics of uh, the load components. And um, also uh, looking at the measurement data, as I mentioned earlier, this gamma P and gamma Q are from the smart meter data. And then the Z here is from the aggregated data uh, at uh, DPMU locations. And um, so these three equations are uh, associated with measurement error due to meter accuracy or approximation error. And the last equation is just to enforce that the pilot uh, has uh, uh, draws positive uh, real power and uh, positive reactive power. So this is the setup of uh, the load recovery. So after uh, uh, Solving this problem, um, uh, I'm able to first from the recovered profile P to locate the change events, and this can allow me to identify a PV charging events very uh, uh, easily. Uh, let's, uh, for example, in this uh, uh, plot here, um, where well, I mentioned that the smart meter data may miss this PV jump uh, from the charging. But then after recovery, um, the recovery profile can very well capture this single change of the PV power increase. And therefore uh, I can um, identify the PV uh, charging activity from this uh, jump event here. So um, to do this identification, I can vary this threshold based on a certain percentage of EV power rating. So this is for monitor the PV, uh, sorry, the EV event. And uh, we can also uh, use the low rank component, which I mentioned earlier, uh, which has the temporal pattern to recover the behind meter solar PV output. So how do we do that? We can first extract the temporal pattern from the right single vector from this low rank compo recovered component L here. And then I do, uh, I try to move the scaling uh, of this uh, temporal pattern such that uh, it has very few changes compared to the aggregator, aggregated observation. And that allows me to recover 
um, the uh, actual uh, solar PV component from uh, the aggregated data. So just to show some results, we have a, a taxonomy feeder, uh, which we look at 30, uh, 30 load nodes, uh, half of them have PVs, and then we have the ground truth data from homes at uh, um, Austin area, uh, actually in the same neighborhood. That's why you see earlier that the solar has all this uh, colorated output. Um, the peak constraint data doesn't have uh, reactive power information, so we synthetically generate it with a uh, power factor in this, uh, uh, actually a lagging power factor in this range. And we also scale the output a little bit to match the original feeder loading. So the smart meter data and also the deep PMU data, um, smart meter data is simply generated through the average and the deep PMU data are actual data provided by uh, the Green Lab D uh, power flow solution. So we uh, use the typical uh, meter accuracy to set up uh, the measurement uh, noise or perturbation level in our optimization model and also account for some uh, the linear approximation error as well. So uh, I'm, we have uh, considered uh, four hypothetic PMU locations. So uh, the first one is the one at the feeder head. Um, um, and then we also consider some lateral like uh, locations on the lateral where they branch out to different uh, laterals. So, um, so the first case is we pick a winter day. So the nice thing about the winter, winter data is that during the nighttime, it's mostly appliance activities or like an EV charging event. So it follows our first uh, uh, characteristics, which is the fast change very well. And because, because of that, we have an excellent uh, performance in detect these EV events. So this is the example that I showed you earlier. We are able to recover exactly where the um, PV data uh, or the, when the PV data happens within the 15 minute interval and having the right power increase associated with this PV uh, 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 charging here. And um, to quantitatively evaluate the performance, we have plotted out what's called the receiver operating characteristics. Basically, the, by varying the detection threshold, we can uh, plot the uh, rates of true positive uh, versus the rates of false positive or like a false alarm. Okay, so the true positive means that there is an actual event and I'm able to detect it. False positive means that there is no event, but my algorithm saw there is an event. So ideally I want the performance uh, or the curves to be close to zero at this point as close as possible. And then what we are plotting here is a different uh, number of DPMU data. So the blue one is no DPMU data, only from the smart meter data. So you can see that the smart meter data has a very low chance of capturing these events. Well, if I only use one um, DPMU, or as I gradually increases the, uh, the number of PMU uh, locations, um, then I have much uh, better performance, actually the recovery rate, if you see from the zoom in view is at least 95% of accuracy that I'm able to uh, recover the actual event when it actually happens. So um, this is uh, uh, the winter nighttime. So I talk about the issue with HVAC uh, appliances. So because HVAC uh, appliances, uh, they happen all the time in the summer uh, uh, days. Um, and this would be the example that we pick a summer day and uh, tested out the recovery uh, performance. So what we are observing here is that this HVAC periodicity, it is present, it is both sparse change and also correlated because it, all the houses has this periodic HVAC events. So it kind of violates our assumption that uh, each uh, demand can be separated into uh, either 
uh, so each uh, uh, um, each uh, the load has these two separate behavior. So this make it more difficult to identify the EV event. And as a result, you can see here the recovered um, is not able to check uh, perfectly on this increase of power demand uh, from the EV events. It uh, still um, follows the uh, EV, sorry, it still follows the smart meter data here. So we uh, expect that uh, as a result, um, the detection performance has degraded, uh, as you can see from this ROC curve here. So um, we are not able to have more than 95% uh, of accuracy. So the accuracy is around 90% here. So um, the uh, again, the issue here is like with the HWAC, they are changing very frequently and also at every house, uh, it, the algorithm can miss some opportunity to correctly identify when there is an actual uh, EV charging event uh, in the house. So a uh, similar observation also in the solar um, recovery. So uh, we use like a winter daytime data and then um, using the solar recovery scheme that I mentioned earlier, basically uh, recover or extract this temporal button from the recovered low rank component. And this is from the right signal vector of this uh, uh, low rank uh, uh, component. And it matches very well the fast transient in this ground truth uh, solar output showing on the left. And um, we use this recovered or extracted temporal pattern to try to disaggregate the DPMU data. So for example, the, from the DPMU data, you can tell a little bit about there is some uh, solar going on here, but then we're not able to know what exactly is the solar uh, uh, level, uh, the output of the solar. But then from this temporal pattern information, we run the algorithm to disaggregate it, then we are able to match very well with the actual PV output, uh, even capturing this uh, fast transient um, in this underlying uh, solar uh, output profile due to um, uh, the irradiance pattern uh, of the solar output. So the same issue comes up in, for the summer daytime recovery. So, and then that's uh, when we use the algorithm for recovering the summer daytime, this is again the temporal pattern. So it by and large follows this parabola shape of the actual PV output. However, you see there's some kind of small perturbation. And as I mentioned earlier, because of the HWAC periodicity, and then it will it is also colorated across different houses, and therefore it will show up in this uh, low rank uh, component as well. So this perturbation like kind of actually follows uh, HWAC periodicity. Um, uh, based on our observation of the real data is around like 10 minutes. So we can potentially filter out this um, perturbation that we don't want from this recovered temporal pattern. Um, so we didn't do that yet, but then we just use this uh, recovered temporal pattern to disaggregate um, um, uh, the DPMU power measurements. And you can see that yeah, uh, we, we are able to uh, still uh, match the solar output, the total solar output uh, from this uh, aggregated data um, follow the trend here. But then again, um, this uh, um, uh, perturbation um, is due to um, the fact that um, in the low rank component, it also contains the HWAC uh, periodicity uh, or the periodic effects of HWAC. Okay, so uh, to sum up, uh, so we have introduced uh, um, a method to use jointly spat uh, spatial temporal measurements of different resolutions uh, to monitor discrete edge uh, um, uh, DR resources. So um, one um, side using the sparse change events of the load uh, profile, we uh, can um, 
detect, say, large appliance or, def uh, or these associated with electric vehicle chargings. Um, uh, using this uh, low rank temporal pattern, we are able to uh, recover the co-located energy sources such as uh, the PV output. So um, the applications or the extensions that we're considering now, um, it, definitely as I show that if once we have this information that we can use that to verify the DER status or any control comments, say charging, discharging comment uh, from the aggregator to an EV. Um, we are also considering uh, an online implementation of making the algorithm efficient. It is pretty fast now, but then there are some uh, uh, directions to make it more uh, efficient. And then um, as you see that um, the HWAC periodicity has posed as some challenge to this recovered uh, temporal profile, profile, so uh, solar profile. So we, we are thinking of doing some filtering on that. Um, the other thing is that uh, uh, using these load characteristics, it, can, uh, it is, um, can potentially help us to design some control strategies for the uh, as well. Uh, basically, we have to consider that the distribution system is operated with all these uh, real events, uh, but then large changes uh, in whenever there is appliance uh, uh, activity, there are probably uh, large change of loading conditions in some locations uh, within the system. So with that, uh, I have uh, concluded the talk. And so I have showed uh, two examples that we use learning um, optimization methods. One is on the wide area monitoring and one is on the great uh, edge monitoring. Um, so we also have some work that I'm not able to uh, introduce today, which is around uh, integrated infrastructure, how to um, design electrify transportation um, at an uh, aggregated location um, uh, in an aggregated manner. So uh, here are some uh, uh, application, uh, sorry, uh, publications related to this work. And uh, um, I can take more questions if there are uh, more. Okay, great. Thank you, Professor Zhu, for your excellent talk.